Raise your hand if you can tell me what this emoji means. Not Katie. You, you are, you're not, okay, yes. Go ahead. It means Pinocchio lied. Anybody else? If I were to text you this emoji, what, what conclusion would you draw? That's very interesting. What? That's, that's right, yeah. I, don't, I try not to text anybody. Okay, so who thinks that this emoji means something to do with lying? Show of hands. Okay, here's what I want you to think about. How do you know that? Don't, don't answer it out loud, just think about it. How, like, think, like actually connect the dots in your head about where you went from this little yellow face to something about lying, okay? So we all know that this goes through the story of Pinocchio, right? But I want you to actually really think hard about how sophisticated of a communication act this is. That, there, that there's this story that most of us are familiar with, either through reading the children's book or, or seeing the movie, and there's this one aspect of that story about some puppet with a magic curse that his nose grows when he lies, and we've grabbed onto that, and it has now entered our common conversation to the point where if I just show you this Im that, that one image, you are able to implicitly, without even thinking about it, connect all of those dots and immediately form a conclusion, okay? So the communication act that's going on here is uh, what you'll see on your handout, this, that little diagram. If you understand that diagram, you will understand this meeting, and you will see this diagram a lot. The way that communication works is that you have an author, and the author has an audience, and the author will produce some text. That could be an emoji, it could be a movie, it could be an actual written text, it could be uh, verbal, anything like that. We're being pretty broad with the term text. That text is then filtered through the shared world, or the cognitive environment, of the author and the audience. And then by interacting with that shared world, the dots are connected and then the message is delivered to the audience. So we have Alvin here, he, call, he texts Carol at random and says Pinocchio face and she's offended. And what's going on here is that emoji is being fed through the shared world where we have this story of Pinocchio and all of that stuff and then the message comes out as a liar. Now, how difficult would that be, that communication act be, if you had never heard of Pinocchio? Imagine going back to you know, the 1630s before uh, the Pinocchio story was written and just showing, I don't know, some random Frenchman a picture of a guy with a long nose. Be incoherent, right? Tracking so far? All right. Keeping cookies on the bottom shelf? All right, good deal. Now, this goes way more than idioms. Okay? The idioms are a good example of this because they are the most extreme example, usually because idioms are pulled from stories. For example, Trojan horses, uh, Achilles heel, um, you know, trying to think of some other ones, but those are, those are uh, the Pinocchio nose, et cetera. They're usually coming from stories that are out there. But it goes way deeper than this. So another illustration, all right? I'm gonna, I have written a story on this slide, and I'm gonna show it to you one paragraph at a time. Now, if you've seen these slides before, do not answer. You're gonna ruin the activity, okay? But I want you, as soon as you have, uh, as soon as you think you can guess where the story is gonna go, like you can fill in the rest of the dots, or the rest of the blanks, I want you to raise your hand, okay? So here's the first sentence. One day, Old Rock, the good ag, okay? Who wants to take a gander as to what comes next? He does something honorable. But, okay, well this full, this, okay, this is gonna be like several paragraphs. So like, what's the basic story structure that I'm about to tell you? Scumbag from another school. Gonna show him up. And then what's the last line gonna be? And that's exactly what we're gonna do to a mags, beat the ever live and ever loving, et cetera, right? Yeah, so just from these, what, six words, seven words, that introduction right there, you've already made a connection in your subculture to this, uh, this story form, and you already know the elements of that story and how it's structured. You've already said there's gonna be a scumbag from another university, and that the key point is that Old Rock's gonna do something to show everybody up. Now, anybody who is not indoctrinated here at A&M is already kind of confused, right? Our graduate students, of course, are what, what, what the heck, right? 
And some of you that are two percenters are probably like, ah, I kind of remember this when I was a freshman, right? But think about it though. Those of you that do know where this story is going, there's a huge barrier that was overcome because you were indoctrinated at fish camp or howdy camp or some variation thereof, and now you're in the cult, right? But if you're outside, this makes no sense. Now, here's the twist. He was, Old Rock was going down Highway 6, and he fell among some highwaymen who jumped him, took his money, left him on the side of the road, beat him, and left him half dead. Now where is this story going to go, Mr. Jett? Probably going to be some people who ought to help him, of his own people. Some good Aggies going to come back. They're going to pass him by, and then some pizza for somebody is going to be the one to save him. Now, uh-huh. Uh-huh. now where did you get that from? Where on earth did you find that from this, this sentence about him having some misfortune along Highway 6? The parables of Jesus? Where is Jesus on here? Now, see, look at this. This is a very sophisticated... Now, you have already picked up... Here's this, one, this whole story structure called the Old Rock, the Good Ag story structure. Here's the parable of Jesus. And you know that the parable of Jesus is an inversion story. And so you have taken those two things together and put it together. Do you realize how cognitively sophisticated of an act that really is? So it, it ta- it's very big brain, Right? So yes, that's exactly what happens. By chance, there was a zip who was going down that way, and he saw a rock, and he passed by. Likewise, a yell leader, when he came to the place, saw him and passed by. But a T-sip, as he journeyed with Bevo, came to where rock was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And the T-sip went to rock and bandaged his wounds and set him on his animal, Bevo, and brought him down to the LaSalle Hotel in Bryan and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two crisp $50 bills, giving them to the owner, saying, take care of Rock, and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back to this place from Austin. Now, my fellow Aggies, I ask you, which of these three proved to have the good bull? <laughs> right? It's a pretty sophisticated story, right? But, I, but the focus here is on, and of course, apologies to our graduate students who have no idea what's going on, but think about how sophisticated this is, because now we're talking, you're, we're talking more than just idioms. We're talking whole story structures, inversions, expectations, characters. And, none of you, and all of you recognize that some of these references are to real people, and some are real places, and some of these are references to not real people at all, and they're sort of archetypal and things like that. It's a very sophisticated piece of artwork. Or, 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 I, I, yeah, it is. I wrote it, so it's sophisticated artwork, right? But it's a very sophisticated piece of literature and interpretation and communication that's going on. So if we use our diagram, uh, our author is telling this story, Old Rock the Good Ag. It's going through this shared world where I expect all of you to understand what an Old Rock the Good Ag story, or Old Rock the Good Ag story is, that you understand all of our symbols and iconography here in Texas, at Texas A&M specifically, that you know what Bevo is, that you know what a zip and a yell leader are. Does anyone know what a zip is? Senior. That's a senior corpsman, so that's like a real, even more niche reference. It's going through that, and it's coming out as a message to you, the audience, that T-SIP's gonna have good bull, right? So I have here just a list of some of those assumptions, right? The community-specific vocabulary, um, the setting of the story. And remember, we started off with the expectation that this was going to put them down, because typically these stories are put-down stories for rivals used in, you know, the, mid- in the midnight yell uh, ritual environment. And so we have a subverted expectation where Old Rock is the one that's beat up. right? Imagine telling this at midnight yell. It's not going to go very well, right? And uh, we have our no- another word here that I have on your definitions, which is an intertextual link to the Jesus parable. So if you look on your um, definitions, there are two big concepts I want to get across. The first one is the shared world or the cognitive environment. So that's all the behavior, beliefs, cultures, values, worldview of a people. And in literature, we're talking about the genre, traditions, text, metaphors, idioms, et cetera. It's a very big concept, all right? And the other idea is intertextuality, which is that texts are often shaped by uh, texts that are outside of themselves. It can be deliberate compositional strategy, so that's what I did, is I took the Good Samaritan parable, and I took an old Rock the Good Egg story, and I made an explicit reworking of that parable into the idiom of Texas A&M. But it can also be incidental connections just through the shared environment uh, or background. Um, So, you know, in the case of like, um, yeah, anyway, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't need to belabor the point, I don't think. I think that's pretty straightforward. 
But you might be asking, okay, nice fun story about tea sips and emojis and whatnot, but what does this have to do with the Bible, right? So the whole point is that the Bible does the exact same thing. And this is the core thesis. If you understand this thesis, you'll understand everything else. Everything else is just examples supporting this thesis, and it's right here at the top. The Bible, like all works of written communication, leaves many elements implicit to be filled in by the audience's assumption. To cooperate with the authors, we need to reconstruct as best as possible the shared world, or cognitive environment, same thing, of the original author and the audience. And an important tool that we're going to discuss in doing this is comparing literature from the same cognitive environment to reconstruct some of those assumptions. So I have here an example, which is an idiom, and you'll love how it comes full circle, is Exodus 34, 6, Moses says, uh, God is long of nose, which in Hebrew idiom is a way of saying that a person is long suffering or merciful. It's a play on uh, saying that someone gets angry, their nose gets hot. Well, if they're long of nose, it means it takes a long time for their nose to get hot. Similar to how we would say someone has a long fuse. But if you run that idiom through the 21st century American context that we did earlier, you end up with God equal Pinocchio emoji, right? So that's not gonna, that's, and that's clearly not what uh, uh, Moses is saying. And um, this is an example where we can't just fill in those gaps and assumptions that, the, you know, that these ancient authors had with our own assumptions. We have to be aware of that. Here's a great quote from uh, C.S. Lewis. He said, the idea that any man or writer should be opaque or difficult to understand to those who lived in the same culture and spoke the same language, shared the same habitual imagery and unconscious assumptions, and yet be completely transparent to those who have none of these advantages is, in my opinion, preposterous. In other words, he's saying, it is ridiculous to think that Moses' audience didn't understand him, and yet we today, with none of the background training or cultural assumptions, can understand him completely uh, perfectly. Okay? And so these are my kind of three main theses that I already stated, um, that the Bible has these implicit details that need to be filled in, and so we have to do some hard work. All right? Any questions so far? Basically, the rest of this is just putting meat on these bones. That's, that's the core idea. Okay, any questions or input? What, what have you done to sell the scripture exactly? An excellent question. So our first point here to set expectations, we're gonna be about an intermediate level, maybe, maybe a little on beginner. I'm aiming more for, th this is more like a building your toolbox, right? Like you need to learn how to do this and then the details are just examples and just to get that point across, okay? So the question here is, like, all right, well and good, but like what peoples, what languages, what texts are we comparing with scripture? Um, and so this comes from this book, Ancient Near Eastern Thought in the Old Testament. Um, and these texts would include obviously Hebrew texts, right? Because that's the language of the, the people in the Old Testament. But also Sumerian, Akkadian, Egyptian, Hittite, Ugaritic, Babylonian, Aramean, Moabite, Phoenician, etc. And which types of texts are we talking about? Well, pretty much everything that's in the Bible. Myths, rituals, hymns, poems, annals, treaties, laws, prayers, royals, inscriptions, prophecy, wisdom literature. If you find it in the Bible, chances are there's another type of genre that's similar to that outside uh, of the Bible by, um, by their uh, neighbors. And to be even more specific, we're going to focus largely on uh, the text of Genesis 1 through 11. And so the four texts that are usually brought up in that conversation are these uh, four uh, Mesopotamian Babylonian texts, which are the Atrahasis epic, the Sumerian king list, the Uridu Genesis, and the Gilgamesh epic. Those are the main texts that we're talking about. So like specifically, if you want to understand Genesis 1 through 11, you will be better served by using these texts. But here's the question, an objection here, right, that Jet kind of anticipated, which is, are you suggesting that we need like some kind of guru to explain the Bible, or does grandma need to read a thousand ancient myths and Sumerian literature to understand the KJV on her nightstand? Like, is the Bible incomprehensible if we don't have these other texts? Does anyone think so? Okay, but at the same time, an old rock, the good store, a good ag story is kind of incomprehensible if you don't know what it is, right? So you gotta bridge that gap somehow. So how do we, as, as if we're coming from a Christian perspective, how do we sort of hold those in tension? So the answer is there's a classic doctrine, apologies to the Catholics in the room, don't care. Uh, this comes from an explicitly Protestant perspective. So there's a very explicitly Protestant doctrine known as the perspicuity of scripture. It has unfortunately been very much abused and misinterpreted um, because there are some people who think, uh, perspicuity by the way is just, that's a fancy word that means clear, the clarity of scripture. 
And so this comes from the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is a classic Reformed uh, confession. And it just states that all things in Scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto all. Yet those things focus very important on, the, on this clarification here. Those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of Scripture or another that not only the learned but the unlearned in a due use of the ordinary means may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. And to put it very succinctly, there is a promise in Scripture that Scripture is clear enough to basically any reader from any culture, as long as you're reading it in your own language and it's a good translation, that the great truths of the gospel can be understood straightforward, right? So if you read the book of Luke, the book of Acts, and the book of Romans, like the gospel is propounded so many times just between those three books that anybody will get it. Just in the book of Acts, like eight times. What must I do to be saved? Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, be baptized into his name, um, you and your household, etc. You can find that like five times just in the book of Acts. But notice, it does not say that you are going to understand the exact rhetorical purpose of something like, say, the book of Genesis for its uh, intended audience. There's no guarantee of that. And so the problem is that when it comes to the persecutive scripture, there are some people, well-meaning people, who think that this entails every single text in the Bible, as it is written in English, can be understood just by reading other texts that are in the Bible, right? Like, if you just read Genesis and something doesn't make sense, somewhere else in the Bible, what's in Genesis will be explained. That is an expectation that is not classically held by Protestants, and it's nowhere made in Scripture. And it's honestly kind of a bit of an unfounded uh, expectation. right? So that, that's how you kind of hold those two things in, in tension. On the one hand, yes, it's clear, especially on those matters that are most important and necessary for salvation. On the other hand, it is an ancient text. It's embedded in a context. And if you are not in that context, then things are going to be confusing for you. Any objection to this? Right. You don't need a phone. And then the second part is... Do we need a guru? And the answer is you kind of already rely on gurus. Because if you checked your English Bible, you would see that it doesn't say that God is long of nose. It says in there that he's merciful and long-suffering. Why? Because some unknown guru that you've never met in a translation office did that work for you. He was the one that figured out what that idiom means. And he was the one that in your NIV Bible says the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in uh, love and faithfulness. So this work has to be done. And thankfully, most of it's done in a translation office and not by you individually, but the work has to be done. So at minimum, like you have to acknowledge that it's happening. All right. Okay. So now the question is, all right, well, how? How exactly do I interact with the, uh, this ancient author? And the answer is cooperation, right? Like we're trying to figure out what he's actually doing. It's a, a, communication is a two-party activity, and it requires you doing your work to understand what he's doing, and he's doing as best he can to communicate to you. And so if you work against the author or try to impose something on the author instead of letting the author do what it is that he wants to do, then you're going to be uh, misunderstood. So a classic example of this uh, that I've heard is there are well-meaning Christians who will say something to the effect of, I take the Bible as literally as I possibly can unless uh, I can't. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but I've heard that. Um, and it sounds good, to some people at least, it sounds good, like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a literalist, I believe the whole thing, I'm very serious about the Bible, and I take it uh, uh, literally unless I can. But why would you do that? Why not take, you, take it as literally as the author intended it to be? Because if you take the author literally when he doesn't intend to be literal, then you're not cooperating with him. And if you take him non-literally when he's meaning himself to be literal, then you're also not cooperating. So you have to figure out, you have to cooperate with the author. If he's speaking literally, take him literally. If he's speaking non-literally, speak him non-literally. And just uniformly saying everything's literal unless there's overwhelming reason to not take it literal, that's not cooperating. That's just being presumptive and saying, I'm going to define the conditions of this text. Right? So the fancy word for this uh, is locution and illocution. So locution is the text and illocution is the message or the intended effect of that, uh, of that text. And so if you focus only on the text and say all the meaning is in the locution, you know, focus on the illocution, then it's going to go right over your head. Okay. And so this, yes, go ahead. How, is it, how are we supposed to know what the author is first to make That is an excellent question, right? So what's important is that um, 
yeah, so here's the, the procedure that, that Lewis recommends, right? He says that, uh, C.S. Lewis says, he says that the first qualification for judging any piece of workmanship from a corkscrew to a cathedral is to know what it is, what it was intended to do, and how it is meant to be used. And so those are the three questions that you ask when coming to a text. What is this text? Like, what is it? What does it do? What was intended to do? And how is it intended to be used? And that's how you come to understand it. So for example, when we talk about the old rock story, we know what it is. It's a fun little, you know, sort of pep rally type thing. Um, it's intended to be used to sort of like hype people up, right? So if you take an old rock story literally as every, or if you take it uh, like that controversy from a couple of semesters ago or seasons, I don't remember what it was, but there was like this big controversy because one of the uh, Midnight Yell stories got leaked. Uh, it was the Appalachian State one, yeah. That got leaked, I don't know if y'all remember this, and it was a big deal. Well, yeah, what happens when you have a text thrown out into the masses and they're not cooperating with the intended audience trying to understand what type of a text that is. You end up with outrage and, ah, it's offensive, right? All that kind of stuff. So the questions, um, so to be more, even more specific, right? So when we talk about what is a text, we have to talk about its literary form, the genre, the style, the register of speaking, um, what the effect is that it's intended to be on the audience, and what kind of audience is envisioned, right? You know, and what knowledge or beliefs um, does that audience share with the author? And what is the social setting of the intended use? Right? So the old rock story is intended to be used at Midnight Yell, which has a very specific social use. You don't use it outside of that. It'd be very inappropriate, for example, to do an old rock story at Mustard. Right? Socially inappropriate. So, um, And so let's dig into a little bit more with the specifics. Like I said, these, this is just to get you kind of a taste of the complexity. You don't have to keep track with all of these uh, things right here. But like um, when we're talking about the literary form, we're talking about like the organization or arrangement or the framework of it. Uh, the genre is the social communicative act along with linguistic, rhetorical, literary conventions and expectations. So like I talked about earlier with the old rock story, there are expectations that are built in. Uh, the register, the style, the language type, um, that just kind of deals with the way in which you're speaking. So uh, a good example of this would be there's a difference between poetic, uh, poetry and poetic language. So you can speak poetically and it not be in the structure of a poem. Alternatively, you can speak uh, in a poem, and yet all the language you use is perfectly ordinary. So here's an example that we have here. Um, you have on the uh, spectrum here, on the bottom you have deeply technical language all the way up to poetic language. Um, and then along the axis you have sort of the literary form. So uh, that would be poetry, narrative, report, or prose uh, discourse. So to use an example, um, in uh, The Pilgrim's Progress, I don't know if any of you have read that, that's a deeply allegorical um, piece of literature. The whole thing is a story, so it's all told in prose narrative, like, and this happened and that happened. But the main character's name is Christian, and he travels through the valley of death. So it's very much like poetic, symbolic, not meant to be you know, literal in that respect. Um, alternatively, a law report would be very technical and, and um, discursive. Make sense? Any questions about this so far? Is this too much information? Okay, cool. I promise we'll get back to the Bible in a second, right? But th all this, what we're focusing on here is what do we mean when we talk about the genre of a text or like how do we identify what a text is, okay? Oh, I forgot I put this in here. This is another example of poetry versus poetic language. So there's a debate in the Tolkien uh, universe as to whether Balrogs have wings and it originates from this line right here. Uh, the Balrog reached the bridge. Um, he faced Gandalf, and the shadow about it reached, reached out like two vast wings. It's a very poetic language. But then later on it says, um, the Balrog stepped forward slowly onto the bridge and drew itself up to a great height, and its wings were spread from wall to wall. Wait a minute, are these literal wings, or is this uh, the metaphor of the shadow that re uh, reaches about it like vast wings? There has been so much debate over whether this is literal or not. It's actually a lot of fun. But that's an example of like poetic language, obviously not poetry, but it's difficult to understand like, okay, so does it have wings or is this referring back to the metaphor? Just an example there. Just All watch right. the movie, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's actually kind of a good point because you're reading an interpretation of it. So, you know, that, that is an interpretation of the text that then gets fixed in how you later read the text. That happens with the Bible all the time, right? Um, 
if I were to ask you to imagine Jonah inside the whale, how many of you think of like a ship, him sitting on a ship with a giant choir of vegetables? Yeah, exactly. A giant cavernous group. Anyway, let's, so looping back to, remember the point is cognitive environment, shared world, that's what we're talking about, right? So when we talk about the genre of a text that it's kind of assumed, like when you read a text, especially in the ancient world, they don't start off with, okay, like if you read a study Bible, it might say, okay, here's who wrote it, here's when it was wrote, written, and here's the basic uh, genre of the, of the text and all that. Um, that was not on the original cuneiform tablet. It doesn't say, this is the Eridi Genesis, and this is its genre. Now let's begin, right? So the ancient audience just assumed that the, that the uh, sorry, the ancient authors assumed the audience was able to pick up on what the genre it was and doesn't ever explicitly restate what it is. So the question then is how do we figure out, um, how do we figure out how these genres work and how, how this literature works? And the answer is we get a really large sample size and we compare them and contrast them. Then we can start to see what elements are flexible versus what elements are fixed versus uh, how they're used. And um, here's another word for you, the reception history of that text. How does that culture initially receive the text and how is it used throughout time? Um, and so the larger sample size that we get, uh, the better picture we're, we're able to see about how these texts are operating and functioning. So to reconstruct that cognitive environment, you need to familiarize yourself with the cognitive output of the re relevant people groups, and then evaluate the parallels between the texts for similarity and dissimilarity to extract uh, the author's communication. Like that's the basic idea here, okay? And here's the direct apologetics application so that we can get back to this, all right? So this is our Alvin and Carroll um, stand-ins here. So a lot of objections to the scripture as well as harmonizations of scripture are predicated on deeply anachronistic understandings of how literature works. Here's an example, right? So um, a lot, you, and you, I won't even bore you with examples, but there are a lot of sort of um, like internet skeptic arguments where it says, look, uh, Epic of Gilgamesh has a guy with a boat. Um, the Bible has a guy with a boat. They're similar, so the Bible must have copied from the other one. Therefore, the value of the Bible is negligible because it's just copying from this other myth. Right? So you might hear it stated like that. And then the response that a lot of Christians will say is just immediately say, no, whoa, 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 hold on, look at how different they are. Look, there's this difference and this difference and the number of days is different and the location is different and uh, Noah isn't Gilgamesh and this is a different language and, that, and, all, and you get into all this thing, right? I don't know if the, anyone's ever seen this before. But the problem with both of these approaches is that they're both predicated on the same assumption, which is similar equals copied and different equals unique and special and independent and Bible equal different special unique, or sorry, special and unique, therefore Bible must be different. It's starting with the a priori assumption that if the Bible is true, then it can have no literary connection with anything else. But this is like a very, frankly, like silly presupposition, right? Because every single text that is written in any kind of group is invariably going to have connections to other texts that are around it. You also have to consider the fact that scripture is written to a people group that know about other religions and know about other myths. So much so that like they kind of start believing them and go off and apostatize from Yahweh, right? So how are they going to apostatize and not learn anything about said religion they're apostatizing to? There's also an example you know, where one of the kings in the book of, I think, Second Kings, can't remember uh, which one it is, he says, he summons all the prophets of Baal together and he says, oh, I'm just gonna do a sacrifice for Baal. And then he convinces them that he's a legitimate Baal worshiper. And then he has them all slaughtered, right? Because you can't have Baal worship in the land of Yahweh. But which, of course, you know, the violence of that text is a conversation for a different time. But the important question is, wait, how was he able to convince everybody he was a Baal worshiper? Like, I'm a Christian, and I don't think I could convince anybody I'm a Roman Catholic, even though that's pretty close to what I believe, right? Pretty close to what I believe as a fellow Christian, no. <laughs> right? But think about it, right? Think about all the similarities between like Roman Catholicism and the regulative principle of worship. And I could not convince you that I'm a Roman Catholic because I'm, I'm not familiar with all the intricacies of, of that, right? So think about how difficult it would be to convince somebody that you're, uh, think about how difficult it would be not to convince someone that you're a religion that's really close to yours, to, to your own beliefs. But like, I don't know, how could you convince someone that you're a Muslim, right? or convince somebody that um, you know, you're some other you know, religion, that you're familiar with those rights. Well, the only way he could do that convincingly is if he actually knew what the rights were, and if he knew what their mythology was, what their law codes were, what their, 
uh, procedures were, what their language was, what their incantation, their hymns. Think about all the literature he had to know in order to do that. Imagine if you were just dumped at St. Mary's and had to do a Latin mass by yourself. It'd be pretty hard, right? Unless you are yourself a Roman Catholic. No. Yeah, Novus Ordo is off limits, yeah. So that's one element. But here's the other question, right? Why think that similar equals copied? I'm going to use an analogy from biology. Don't get scared, OK? Which of these came first? What are these, first of all? These are eyeballs, OK? The right one came first? OK. These are unrelated to each other. We're presuming Darwinian evolution is true for the moment, OK? These are not related to each other, but they look identical, right? Their structures are exactly the same. The tell is that you see number four on the left. Do you see number four on the right? You, it, you can't even see the difference probably on the slide. But those uh, optical nerves there that are connecting, they connect on the front for the ones on the left, and they connect on the back for the ones on the right. So this is a mammalian eye, and that is a cephalopod eye. That's like an octopus eyeball on the right. Mammals and octopi evolved eyes completely independently under Darwinian evolution. Okay. And yet, they look identical. You probably wouldn't be able to identify them unless I told you specifically that that's what the difference is. Right? So this is a phenomenon in biology called convergent evolution. It shows up a lot of times where you have similar structures, homologous uh, structures, and you would think, oh, well, they have the same structures because they're derived from common ancestry. But even under you know, a Darwinian evolutionary paradigm, they're not related. Bats and birds are examples. Um, Dolphins and uh, fish are examples, things like this. And the thing is that literature is the same way. So you can't just assume, oh, because they look the same, they must have some sort of ancestry, right? Because biologically, you have independently, independent convergence on these form factors. Similarly, you can have independent uh, convergence on form factors with literature. This happens, for example, if you look in uh, like mythology from the Aztecs and mythology from the Babylonians. You'll see points of commonality. Obviously, they have no, they had, there's no way they could have con contacted each other. And the Aztecs didn't borrow from the Babylonians, but you can see some like similar structures in, in that uh, regard, mainly because those are they're writing stories that are doing the same thing in their culture. And because they have the same function, they're going to start to have some of the same features. That's just an analogy. If it's helpful, use it. If it's not helpful, whew, disregard. Okay. So when we talk about similarities and differences, here's a spectrum that Walton uses, again, in this book, which is highly good, um, is recognizing that you don't just have things that are similar and different, and you don't just have copy-paste going on, you actually have this spectrum of similarity to differences. So um, obviously, in the, uh, we'll start from top to bottom. Obviously, in the case of like you know, two texts that have nothing in common with each other, they could be completely different. They have no, no connection whatsoever. You could have uh, where one group is loosely familiar with what's going on with this other group, but they're just making fun of them. They're not like critically engaging with what they believe. Um, in the middle, you have actual like polemics and debate and contention where there's deep familiarity with the position on both sides, but they, you know, uh, but they disagree with each other, and so they're actually debating. But they're debating as like very well known. The, uh, you can see this, for example, in Isaiah. Isaiah's polemics against the um, the idol worshippers that are in Israel, right? Point of contention. Uh, then you have similarities. Moving into the similarities, you have awareness of literature that leads to adaptation or transformation. Where, um, and you can see this, uh, I can give some examples. So in the Psalms, you know, this might make you uncomfortable, but there are some Psalms that are pretty much the exact same wording as um, uh, songs that are uh, offered to Baal. So there's text from Ugarit, which is just north of, of Israel. Um, and there's this huge text called the Baal Cycle, which it's a whole mythology about the god Baal. And Baal's like one of the main gods that uh, the Israelites defect to a lot. Well, it turns out there are a lot of structural similarities because um, between how Baal is described and how Yahweh is described. And you can find in the Psalms, in the Bible, that there are hymns in the Psalms that are almost verbatim what you would find uh, sung to Baal, but instead they're sung to Yahweh. In that case, they're saying, well, you got a banger of a song, but like you got the wrong God. Or vice versa, David had a banger, and then the guys up north decided, hey, that's pretty good, but they've got... They've got the wrong God, right? So like, th that's, that's an example of like, where that happens. It even happens today. Like, uh, a lot of your favorite Christian hymns are rewrites of secular tavern songs. Or, yeah, or the one that, uh, that I sent to Sam recently. I saw a rewrite of that song. I put the new 4Gs on the G, which is like rewritten for a, uh, is rewritten for a Christian audience. It's pretty funny. 
Anyway, and then at the very bottom, you have conscious imitation or borrowing or restructuring. And then finally, uh, a subconscious uh, shared heritage, where you just have two cultures that really are, like they do come from the same place. And, and at a certain point in their distant past, they kind of were the same people. And so you have some of that literature and awareness that sort of trickles down into to both groups. Okay, So that's basically the idea. All right. Now, with all of that background out of the way, we're going to talk about a specific case study, because we're actually going to look at Genesis and some creation myths. Um, but I want to look at your handout here, um, which is uh, kind of building on off of this. So like, all right, this is an example of similarities and differences, but like, what do we actually do with this? Okay. And so there are 10 principles that I have here that I want to go through very quickly. So first, the error that Calvin, Calvin, <laughs> Carol and Alvin had was that Alvin was polemically only considering difference, or sorry, similarities, right? Only considering the similarities, and Carol was only considering the differences for, towards a polemical purpose. But to do proper comparative analysis to rebuild that cognitive environment, we have to consider the similarities and the differences. And secondly, recognizing that the similarities could actually be indications of shared elements in that cognitive environment, and they're not uh, literature being borrowed one to the other. So you can think about genre forms that are shared, right? Thirdly, the similarities can be at the surface, but there could be differences at a conceptual level or the other way around. So um, there are some stories, uh, for example, like Sargon of Akkad, his story is very similar to Moses' story in that both of them as babies were put in baskets and then sent down the river. Surface similarity, but on a conceptual level, completely different. Why was Sargon put in the, uh, the boat? His mom was trying to kill him. Why was Moses put into the boat? His mom was trying to save him. So on a conceptual level, the reason they're in the boat is like completely different. We could talk about that example in more detail if you want. Um, but you can also have that the other way around. Uh, fourth, all of the elements must be understood in their own context before cross-cultural comparisons. So we're going to talk a little bit about Genesis. And one of the things that's most important is that we need to consider how did the Hebrews use Genesis? What did Deuteronomy make of Genesis? That is what we have to understand first before we try to put uh, Genesis in conversation with, say, the Enuma Elish or the Eridu Genesis or, or anything like that. Fifth, uh, proximity in time and geography increases the possibility of interaction and influence. So I talked about how um, if you consider that the Hebrews were constantly surrounded by nations that were following other gods, were occasionally conquered by these other nations, um, were trading and intermarrying with them, that makes a lot of sense that there's going to be connection there. So, for example, the Moabites uh, have like cultural and ethnic and geographical proximity to the ancient Israelites. So their literature is very relevant when it comes to um, evaluating you know, uh, certain parallels that are there. Whereas, um, for example, like you know, the ancient Celts, they're not going to have much influence uh, on, on Israel, seeing as they're you know, thousands of miles away. Right? Six, a case for literary borrowing requires identification of likely channels of transmission. This is what Alvin forgot to do. He just said, oh, they're similar, therefore they must be the same. They must be copied. But unless you can actually identify what is the causal chain that leads from this text actually getting into this text, then you don't really have anything like that. Right? Six, the di or, sorry, seventh, uh, the differences between literature are minimized if the works are not of the same genre. Uh, eight, that's self-explanatory. Similar functions can be performed by different genres in different cultures. Um, so, for example, you could have uh, stories that are, um, for example, you can have like songs that serve as founding myths as opposed to narratives. That would be an example. Ninth, uh, borrowing often transforms. So C.S. Lewis has a good, example, a good quote here. Stories do not reproduce their species like mice. In other words, what uh, Carol has to take into consideration is that even if there's a case of borrowing, right? Like if somebody takes a story and, uh, from another culture and puts it into their culture, very rarely is it just literally copy-paste. There's going to be some transformation that's happening in that process. Okay? And yet there still is derivation that, that's occurring. Um, and then finally, a single culture will rarely be monolithic, either in cross-section or throughout time. So what that means is that you don't want to fall into the trap of the ancient Jews believed this. Like, you can treat all ancient Jews as if they're one thing. Uh, the you know, pre-monarchic, post-monarchic, uh, post-exilic, pre-exilic, Hellenic, like there are multiple stages of Jewish history, and they're not the same throughout all time. And they're also, at any cross-section that you take, you're going to find differences. So in particular, um, the northern Israelites were routinely apostatizing, according to the Bible at least, way more than the Judahites that were in the south. 
So that's like a major cultural difference uh, between them, okay? So those are some principles to take in mind rather than just saying, oh, they're different, oh, they're similar, et cetera, okay? So with those in mind, we'll, we'll look at this case study with Genesis and creation myths, but um, let me pause real quick. Are there any comments or questions? I know I'm throwing like a lot of information, but I hope most of it's intuitive. Just kidding. Okay, so I will go pretty quickly just with the time we have here to talk a little bit about Genesis. Okay, so remember our questions here. We gotta figure out what it is, what it's doing, and how it's used, and then also do a little bit of comparison. Now, there is gonna be a little bit of just trust me bro on this because we don't have time to actually read Genesis 1 through 11 or the Atrahasis epic or any of these other texts that are here. Um, it would take 45 minutes just to read Genesis 1 through 11. So you're just gonna have to trust me, but I advise you to please like read these texts later um, on your own. So if you go in the back, we'll look at this case study really quickly. Um, and I should mention, so at the bottom of page one, you'll see ancient Near Eastern thought in the Old Testament. Page one is largely coming from this book here. Highly recommend this book. Very, very good. Especially relevant for the Old Testament. On the back, if you look at the bottom, you'll see this is being plagiarized. Sorry, it's being adapted from uh, John Collins's Reading Genesis Well. Also, very good book on communication, okay? So let me just kind of give some brief background to these uh, texts here. So these are all from Babylon, uh, Babylon and Sumer. Um, and the reason that these texts are chosen to interact with Genesis is because Genesis basically places its, uh, and the Hebrew people more broadly, um, claim to originate from Mesopotamia. So whenever it says that Abraham comes from the land of Ur, that's Ur of the Chaldees. That's considered probably somewhere in like where Babylon later would be. Uh, Genesis 11 references the Tower of Babel, which is also considered to be a reference to Babylon. So um, most scholars have said that the most profitable cultures to compare Genesis 1 through 11, it's either going to be uh, Babylonian culture and, with, and by extension Sumerian culture, because Sumerian uh, was what was before Babylon, or Egyptian culture, because the Hebrews were enslaved in Egypt and um, were highly influenced by them. Most scholars fall out on the, it looks like it's more in conversation with Babylonian texts, but you could do this same sort of exercise with, with Egyptian text. The other problem is that there isn't as much sort of like creation mythology when it comes to the Egyptian text, so that's, there's just a paucity of data on that front, okay? So here is um, kind of a summary of these, of the five main beats that are in each of these stories. So I'll start with Genesis 1 through 11 because we're most probably most familiar with this. But Genesis 1 opens up with this cosmic creation story that occurs over the space of six days. And then Genesis 2 follows that up with a story of how humanity is created. As we probably remember, um, man is taken out of the dirt. There's a nice pun there. Adam is taken from the Adama uh, and formed into a living creature. Genesis 3, there's rebellion um, as um, the uh, humans, they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil rather than the tree of life. They are kicked out of the garden, they're banished, there's a talking snake involved, there's um, a flaming sword, a cherubim that's involved. And then we launch into Cain and Abel, and then there's a long genealogy. Um, Seth, Enosh, et cetera, Enoch, blah, 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 a whole bunch of names that we usually skip over. And then we get to the third uh, beat, which is we come to Noah. Noah is a righteous man in the world, uh, the only righteous man, everyone else is filled with um, evil and what have you. And um, God says, I'm going to destroy the planet with a flood, he does, except you, Noah, build a boat. Noah builds a boat. Uh, the animals get onto the boat. There's a big deluge, a disaster. And then uh, Noah uh, and his family, they have a new start. They reestablish humanity on earth. And then we have genealogies, the sons of Noah, the table of nations is Genesis 10, blah, 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 all the way down to modern times, which would be the foundation of the city of the Tower of Babel, which is then destroyed and then splits up the nations. And now it's like, okay, now everybody knows what we're talking about. Here's Abraham. So Abraham comes in in chapter 12, and then it's basically Abraham's family for the rest of the um, uh, book. So think about that for a minute. Chapter 12 through 50 covers what, like five generations? 
and chapters one through 11 cover untold generations. Like there's literally no telling how far back Genesis one through 11 goes. So thousands of years at minimum, billions of years at the, the upper limit. And then the last of uh, Genesis is like really, really slows down. So because of that distinct sort of shift in tone, uh, most scholars recognize Genesis one through 11 is kind of its own thing. It's related to Genesis 12 through 50. It's definitely integrated, but it's kind of doing something a little bit different than, than the rest of the story, okay? So now compare that with the Sumerian king list. So the Sumerian king list, as the name implies, is a list of kings of Sumer. Um, it is presuming that creation has already happened from the gods, that the kingship was delivered from heaven to human beings, and it's mostly just a list of these kings and their reigns. And interestingly, these kings live for like insane amount of time. Like their reigns are 18,000 years, 10,000, 9,000 years. Until eventually you come to Gilgamesh and then there's a flood. And then after Gilgamesh, you have another reign of kings um, and then all the way down to modern times as it is today. Now, what's interesting about this is that um, these kings, even though they live for like obscene amount of years, they are taken by the Sumerians and the later Babylonians. They're taken to be real people. In fact, some of them are confirmed to be actually like archaeologically independently verified as real human beings. So to make the argument, oh, this guy lived for 18,000 years, so he's fake, doesn't actually follow. Um, because there are a fair amount of these uh, kings that did, that did live, even though their reigns are listed as like 900, 800 years. So nobody really knows what that's all about, but there's kind of an interesting phenomenon there. Next, we have the Atrahasis epic, similar. Uh, creation is assumed. The gods create the humans to do the work. Um, but the humans make too much noise, and so they decide too many human beings, we're gonna send a flood, send a flood. Atrahasis is selected, he's like uh, um, one of the gods, uh, it's either, in, I think it's Enlil, says, hey, the gods have told us there's gonna be a flood, get a boat, get out of Dodge, he does, it's good, there's a new start, Atrahasis starts humanity over, then we have modern times that sort of pick up. And then the Uridu Genesis, the same thing, it narrates the creation by the gods, they order the cosmos and everything, cities are instituted, there's some missing text, but humanity does something wrong. It's unclear. We have another flood, another arc, um, and then there's a new start from the survivors of the flood, and then modern times are implied. Okay. So the main similarities that we can see here is we've got a, we have some like fantastic fantastical elements. So let's see here. I'll skip through this. I actually have the text on the slides um, if you want to read through them later. Oh, here's uh, here's the list that I was talking about. So yeah, the kings of Sumer, 36,000, 64,000, 43,000, 83,000, blah, 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 420 years, nice, et cetera. So what are the main, uh, what are the main like creation beats that we have here? So we have creation, fall, flood, genealogies. Like this is kind of shared throughout all of these. And so what are some similarities and differences? Well, one of the main similarities, of course, is the structure. You have these same, uh, these episodes that are going on. And what you see is that there's this interest in saying, hey, this is modern times. Like all of them have this understanding, this is what's going on now. And there's an interest in all of these texts to try and root it back as far as they can in the, dis in the distant, murky, um, dare I say, mythological past, right? Genesis does it, Atrahasis does it, all, all of them do it. In fact, the purpose of the Sumerian king list is like they're trying to go back as far as they can. That's part of why these ages are so long, right? So there's an interest there. But there's also this sort of assumption in all of these texts that like, they're not just making things up, right? This isn't just, oh, hey, here's a fun story about Achilles or Heracles or what have you. Like, they're really saying, no, these are people that lived and actually formed our culture. But something about them, the era they lived before the flood was just completely different um, and weird, right? So, there, but there is a lot of similarity there. Some of the key differences would be, um, there's a lack of theogony in Genesis. So, uh, this isn't so much relevant, but there's, a, there's another text called the Enuma Elish, which is also like included uh, as a Babylonian text that's relevant. And that talks about where the gods come from. And creation comes about through a war of the gods. So famously, Marduk is um, in a fight with a snake god named Tiamat. And he rends Tiamat in half, throws her uh, upper body into the skies to make the firmament, and her lower body down to make, the earth, uh, to make the earth. So the heavens and the earth were created by rending Tiamat in half. Obviously in Genesis, we have, and God just said, let there be a firmament and let there be earth. So there's a very different theology there. And perhaps like the biggest difference is all of these stories have a bunch of gods and they're all sort of bickering and they're all you know, very polytheistic and whatnot. But the Genesis stories, and I very emphasize here, the Genesis stories are very clearly monotheistic. 
There's only one God that's in the picture. There's only one guy that's doing anything. And he's not cooperating with other gods. He's not even creating other gods. He is creating things and designating them for their purpose. For example, um, so like uh, many of these other cultures would have a god who's dedicated for the sun, like Shamash or something like that. But in the, um, in the Hebrew Genesis, you have God creates the light, he creates the dark, he appoints a greater light, which is just a part of nature, it's not a god in and of itself, and a lesser light to rule the night, right? Very, very different uh, theology. There are other differences, but I have left that as an exercise for you to go home and fill out other differences, because I don't want to just tell you this, right? Um, so what is it? Is it a myth? Possibly, yeah. People get scared if people say this. Um, the emphasis here is Genesis can be described as a myth in the sense that it is filling that same function that other texts that we unobjectionably call myths are doing. They are trying to say, this is where we come from. This is our role in the universe. This is how God made everything. This is the grand story, right? Everybody has that. And when you ask the Hebrews, like, what text goes in this slot? It's the Genesis 1 through 11. But as we said, that doesn't mean that it's made up of falsehood. It doesn't mean it's fake. It doesn't mean that it's copied from these other ones or anything to, to that effect. Um, there are a bunch of other elements here. But the main point here is, um, well, we could say myth or we could say mythohistory is another term for this because it's basically saying it does myth, like it achieves the purpose of myth with history is like kind of, kind of what it's doing. Um, here are some guys that agree with me. And then this is the, the summary point uh, here. So um, when we talk about what it is, so it has some similarities. It's primarily narrative, but there's also genealogy that ties everything together. And the genealogies are presumed to be real people. And again, some of these people are independently attested in the archaeology. The main, what does Genesis do, specifically Genesis 1 through 11? So it's meant to convey primarily these important theological truths about this is how God relates to his universe. Um, it also shows that God is the God of the whole universe and, and the whole world, and not just for Israel, so it's part of that. Now, the last question is, how is Genesis 1 through 11 actually used? And this is where we would have to get a little bit further. I'm just kind of copying from uh, Collins at this point in the, in the understanding of Genesis as well. But remember I said that when we compare this literature, we can, see, we can see where Genesis kind of compares to these other myths and what it's doing. But it's more important, to, it's uh, arguably more important to see what does Genesis do in the context of the Hebrew people. And where Genesis fits in there is it is the opening to the Pentateuch, the first five books of uh, the Bible. And the Pentateuch consists of what's called a constitution, if you will, of the people of Israel. It says who we are, this is where we come from, this is our story, this is, these are the rules we follow, um, and this is how we are going to live in the universe. So like the first five books of Moses, like that's who we are. And Genesis 1 through 11 is the introduction to that constitution. So it's intended to be read as the preface, essentially, or the framing narrative for the entire rest of, uh, of the Pentateuch. I have some longer takeaways about Genesis specifically, but here are the main ones for what we talked about. Like I said, that's just a case study. You don't need to remember all of that at all. But the main things are that we have to cooperate with the author by entering the same cognitive environment. So we need to enter the, the ancient world of uh, the author and not try to impose things on the text outside of ourselves. And so we shouldn't fill in the gaps with our own cultural assumptions. We shouldn't assume that Genesis is trying to tell the same, uh, answer the same questions that we might be asking. Second, we do need to identify what a text is and what it does and how it's used, and not presume that this text is doing or, uh, something else or that we set anachronistic expectations. Right? Some people say, oh, there's no place for myth in the Bible. Well, says who? What if Moses wanted to write something that functioned like a myth in the Bible? Who are you to say he can't do that? Right? Um, the question is, he, maybe he could, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, maybe I'm wrong. You can argue with me about it, that's fine. But we can't just start at the beginning and say, no, he didn't do this. He couldn't have done this, right, based on my understanding of, of, the, of the world. Um, third, we need to understand the cognitive environment by comparing the intellectual outputs of the other cultures and not silo the text by cutting off its intertextual links. So like I said, we can't just read the Bible in the context of only the Bible. We're going to miss out on really important things. And uh, fourthly, we need to consider both the similarities and the differences. So we don't want to highlight just the similarities and say, ah, there's plagiarism. We don't want to highlight only the differences to prove uniqueness. And finally, you say you've got 69 slides and like 25 takeaways, right? What, what's this all about? So you can download these slides and read everything uh, at this link right here. So.
I know that's a lot of information, but yes. That's actually not a joke. There actually are 69 slides. Like, <laughs> like that was, I, and I didn't even do that intentionally. Like, that's not a joke. I just, I just said, how many slides do I have? And that's how many. All right. So that's a lot of information. I hope that was helpful. Let me go back to the main takeaways here. Um, we have time for one comment or question, and I will take it. Yes, sir. Sorry, with Right. Would there have been like a reason that like, because there's like some deeper meaning in that text there? Like, well, so these are all those cases where like, I, I, it's it's frustrating to have this conversation because there is just a lot of you got to trust me on this, right? Like you have to actually like read the story. Um, this is a case where I can give you an article. I can even tell you the guy's name. Uh, Donald Redford was the guy that wrote this article who did like a deep dive in comparison in comparing it. So I'm not pulling this out of nowhere. The long and short of it is the only thing that those stories have in common are the guy was put in a boat as a baby. Like that's the only thing that they have. The conditions of why he was put in a boat, the location of the boat, the nature of the boat, the words used for boat, like all of those things are different. On top of that, remember we talked about transmission, like uh, the, you have to identify a channel of transmission. When we identify the Sargon story and the Moses story, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of questions about when these were written and where they were written. It doesn't matter which one you take. Um, the best you can get is there's like a one-year overlap between them. Um, the Moses story at its very latest, uh, if, if you take the earliest possible date, you're looking at like 1250 or so BC was when it was written. Latest possible date, like 700 BC. The Sargon story is completely unknown prior to like 600 BC. So you have at least a gap of 100 years where the latest possible date the Moses story is written, and then you have the first textual attestation of the, uh, of the Sargon story. So in a case like that, it's like, well, you have this one common element, but there is only the most tenuous link that these would have literarily. It's more likely than not that you just had two people that put their babies in boats, and that's all that's in common between them. And like I said, there's a lot of just trust me on this because like, I would have to get deep into like Egyptian verb forms to, to make the argument. Like it's a very complex type of, type of argument. Okay, anybody else? Is this helpful at all? Moderately helpful? Okay, I'll take it. All right, well I really appreciate your time. I know this was extremely dense. Like I said, uh, you can download all the stuff here. You can't download it now because I haven't uploaded it, but you will be able to download it in like 20 minutes when I've, when I've put it up there. So. Thanks.